Hello, my little loves. And are you ready for chapter seven of Soup on Ice? Here's the picture that goes with this one. Remember that guy, his name is Slosh Dubinsky and he owns Slosh's Hot Time Pool Parlor. So looks like the boys have come to the pool parlor. And if you remember the last chapter, you know what they're there to ask him to do, right? So let's see how this goes. Did everybody have a good day, by the way? I never asked you that, but did you have a good day? I hope so. Okay, chapter seven. This is it, said Soup. It was the next day after school, and the two of us stood nervously on Main Street, looking up at a sign. The blood red letters said, Slosh's Hot Time Pool Parlor. The butterflies in my stomach now seemed to be firing machine guns. I'd heard that this was the roughest and toughest hangout in town. Rumor persisted that in Slosh's, a guy who still had both ears and all his teeth was called a sissy. Even though I was wearing mittens, I started to gnaw on my fingernails. Rob said, Soup, maybe we ought to draw straws to see which one of us goes inside to ask him, and I hope it won't be Soup Vincent who loses. Maybe, I said, praying that it wouldn't be Rob Peck who had to open that big black door to face Mr. Stanley Dubinsky. We should both go in. Slosh's Hot Time Pool Parlor was the one local establishment into which my mother had warned me I was to never set foot. Soup's mother had told him the same, threatening that if he ventured inside, his behind would enjoy a hot time of its own. Aunt Carrie, I clearly recalled as I now stared at Slosh's door, had also delivered a lengthy and vehement sermon on the evils of Slosh's Hot Time Pool Parlor and about pocket billiards in general. Pool balls, Aunt Carrie concluded, are the devil's rosary. Are you... <laughs> Ask your parents to explain that one. Are you scared, I asked Soup. No, I'm not scared. <clears throat> Me too, I admitted. Yet with a cautious tread up the three creaking stairs we climbed, and we now faced the big black door that warned men only. You knock, Soup told me. Not me. Slosh was your idea. After a short debate on who would handle the knocking, we both knocked softly. Knuckled softly, it says. But all we heard in response was a roar of deep men-only laughter from inside. Maybe they don't hear us, said Soup. We knocked again, but nobody came to welcome us to Slosh's forbidden fortress of fun. Let's go inside, Soup, said. You go first. I took a deep breath. Okay, but you darn well better come along too. As Soup turned the knob, I pushed. Nothing happened, so we both pushed and the door yielded. A pungent men-only aroma of tobacco smoke and beverages, which I couldn't identify as soda pop, tortured my nostrils. It's sort of dark in there, I told Soup, as the crack of the door widened and a sharp clack of scattering pool balls punctured my ears. Somebody swore. Yet the cuss words hadn't come from a male voice. It was definitely a lady who had employed the vibrant vocabulary. Mustering my spunk, I risked a stealthy advance of one more inch. Are you going in? Sue passed me. Not unless you push me. He pushed. And into the murky atmosphere we crept. I sure was grateful that Soup had come too, even though he, like I, had been probable enticed more by curiosity than courage. Pool balls clattered, and once again I heard a fascinating blend of ludity and laughter. Yeah, Miss Rosie, a male voice chided, a large lady in a red satiny dress, whom I presumed to be Rosie herself, suddenly turned around and spotted us as Soup and I approached a big brown pool table. Her cheeks, lips, and hair were three different colors, yet all entirely red. A thin cigar smoldered from a corner of Rosie's painted mouth. I swallowed, hearing Soup do the same. Unable to hold my breath any longer, I breathed, feeling as though I was playing a dirty trick on my lungs. Slosh, snarled Rosie through clenched teeth as she leaned on her cue stick and flicked her cigar. You got company. 
One of the big lumberjacks spat at a spittoon and missed and then pointed at us and laughed. Do you guys know what a spittoon is? For guys who um, chew chewing tobacco, they chew it and it gets into a kind of a spitty, nasty kind of a, I don't know, stuff in their mouth. And then a spittoon was kind of an old fashioned way of, it was like a big kind of a vase or urn kind of a thing and they would spit their spit into the spittoon. I bet it stunk really bad. Anyway, the lumber, one of the big lumberjacks spat at a spittoon, missed, then pointed at us and laughed. Maybe them two young sports come to see you, Rosie. But the man was promptly silenced by a swift and well-aimed jab of Rosie's cue stick. As she, as the wounded victim spilled his sudsy beverage, the other men howled with appreciation. Hey! All heads turned to see Mr. Slosh Dubinsky. I blinked. Every guy in the place was big, yet Mr. Dubinsky towered mightier than any two of them, and wider. What in the blankety blank are you blankety blank kids doing in this blankety blank place, he inquired. That was a lot of swears, huh? Go ahead and ask him, Soup whispered. Mr. So he wouldn't have said it that way. He would have said, go ahead and ask him, Soup whispered. Mr. Dubinsky glared at Soup. What's your name, kid? Robert Peck, said Luther Vinson. Slosh then looked down at me. Luther Vinson was all I could think of to say, so I said it. Well, growled Mr. Dubinsky, you blankety-blank small fry ain't allowed in this blankety-blank place. So get the blankety-blank out. We came, I gurgled, for a favor. One of the mill workers at another pool table let out a loud laugh. Rosie yelled, your gentleman friends is either over 70 or under 10. Ha ha ha. Lifting a pool ball from its bed of green felt, Rosie wound up and then released one beauty of a sidearm curve, a pitch that would have earned her a uniform on any team in the major leagues. As the ball thudded into the heckler's stomach, his eyes crossed. What kind of blankety-blank flavor, favor, asked Slosh Dubinsky in a whisper that could have been heard clearly in a sawmill. Soup nudged him. Tell him. Taking a deep breath, I told him. I explained our mission in detail. Mr. Dubinsky, I said, it seems like Joe Sutter slept on the ice. Miss Boland's cousin up in Thurgood sings in the choir. Bert Motley's got the flu. Mr. Jubert doesn't smile because Emma came back. And we've already heard Vernal Wilcox's saxophone. Mr. Kesky is too skinny and Stilson Wiener moved out of town. The frown on Mr. Dubinsky's face gradually untwisted into an expression of confusion. He scratched his beard with a giant paw. I don't get it, kid. What in the name of blankety blank has all that blankety blank stuff got to do with me? <clears throat> well, I gulped. We really need somebody to be Santa on Christmas Eve because everybody we um, asked has said no and you're our last chance, so please be our Santa Claus. As I said it, the entire congregation of mill workers, lumberjacks, and Rosie all exploded into howls of laughter. Giant index fingers the size of salamis pointed at Slosh. Huge fangs parted to hoot at him in a rowdy round of ridicule. The happy hollering persisted till Mr. Dubinsky entered his decorous plea for quietude. All you blankety-blank people shut the blankety-blank up. They stilled except for one large lumberman who persisted in twitting the proprietor. By then, but then he too became silent when Slosh gently covered the man's entire head and neck with an inverted and rapidly emptying spittoon. Oh, gross. He dumped the spittoon on the guy's head. Ugh. Anyway. Where next, I heard Soup say, glaring down at us, Mr. Stanley Dubinsky, now posing as the typical concerned citizen, startled me with his modest request for further information. Why in the blankety-blank do you blankety-blank kids think I'd want to dress up in some blankety-blank red suit and pretend that I'm a blankety-blank Santa Claus? I swallowed. Because, I told him in a weak whisper, some of the kids in town don't get much of a Christmas. 
to a kid like Allie Tidwell who has to pick up coal along the railroad tracks, if you could be Santa, it would mean a lot, Mr. Dubinsky, to Allie and to his mother. Some of the pool shooters laughed until Slosh wordlessly begged for silence by throwing a chair. <laughs> he scratched his fluffy white beard again. Yeah, he said softly, being poor like them Tidwells, it ain't no blankety-blank fun. I was a poor kid, and as I recall, it was a doggone sorry deal. It would be the greatest thing you ever did, Mr. Dubinsky, I said. Honest, it would. That became the moment when I received the most jarring shock of my entire life. Mr. Slosh Dubinsky bent down and squinted at me with one bloodshot eye, exhaling a stained breath, the fumes of which could have peeled away varnish. I'll do it, Luther, he whispered. And that's the end of chapter seven, where Mr. Dubinsky agreed to be Santa Claus. <laughs>